Growing up in New Orleans, uh, Tuesdays were a big deal for me because that was the day when new CDs dropped at Circuit City. And so, especially when I got old enough to drive and have a car, that would be uh, an appointment visit of mine to go to Circuit City and see what new CD dropped. Typically, it was another No Limit Records CD because they dropped every week. I have that same feeling now when Mirren Fader drops one of her... Um, Peerless profiles, her, her, her long form features for the ringer now. It's like, stop what you're doing, uh, hold all my calls. It is now time to read uh, the latest uh, magic uh, that Mir and Fader has put on wax. <laughs> so it's a pleasure uh, to bring one of the best feature writers in the business, one of the dopest storytellers in the game right now. The Ringers, uh, Mirren Fader is here with us. So good to have you. Sorry to fan. I told you I was gonna fanboy out. So you gotta, you gotta, you guys gotta take these flowers. <laughs> My God. Okay, it's all downhill from here. I can't live up to that. <laughs> but, um, I appreciate that so much. Thank you. No, you're very welcome, and thank you for uh, all the fine journalism you are doing, which we will get into that word, journalism momentarily. But I got to start at the beginning with you. I, I love origin stories. I love your origin story. I'm going to read straight from your website bio because I'm just, <laughs> I, I get a kick out of this. And I, I, this, is, this is just the best origin story of a writer I've ever heard. In fifth grade, Mira became the first girl to join her elementary school's all boys basketball team. The boys didn't like it. They didn't pass her the ball. They guarded her tougher than usual, even pushing her to the ground and sending her to the emergency room once. But she loved the challenge, so she kept coming back. She's still coming back. Hoops led her to writing. Writing leads her back to hoops. There's so much to unpack there. Let's start <laughs> with the inspiration to go out for the boys' basketball team. Tell me that story. It's so crazy because I just saw all these boys like rushing to the basketball court like during lunch one day and it looked literally like an exodus. They were all going and I just something in me. It's so weird to this day. I don't even know how to describe it. I just felt like, where are they going? I have to go with them. And I didn't know anything about basketball. Like, let's be honest, like I was probably wearing a dress like I did not know anything, but I was so compelled to go with them. And when I went and I shot a ball, which definitely missed, I was just like, <laughs> this is it. <laughs> this is it. Like, I need to do this. Like, this is, I just knew it. It's weird. It really was love at first sight. And I was just obsessed with it. And that guy that ended up like tackling me, that was like a really horrific day. But then when I came back to the school, one of the guys on the team was like, you really took that hit. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, I've been wait, you got Wait, you got tackled. So the bio, your bio says you got pushed to the ground and sent to the emergency room. You got tackled, it sounds like. He pretty much did. Like, this guy ended up playing D1 football, like, 20 years later. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I what's feel his like name? No, so, but they're not naming him. <laughs> and it was a, kind of the early coming of this. And it just, it, to me, it felt like a tackle. It felt intentional um, mm -hmm. because it was like, who is this scrub? Like, she does not know how to play. Who is this little girl? Probably three feet tall. And he just, it pushed me so hard. It did feel like a tackle. And so when my, this guy on the team was like, you really took that hit. I was like, wow. Okay. Like, my mom is upset. Everybody's upset. And I'm like thrilled. I'm like, I took a hit. Like, I'm good. Um, so <laughs> right. me, I was like, I this was like the, yeah, this was like the pride in bruises and bumps that would come for years to come. <laughs> um, Listen, let me first of all, let me tell you something. And I, I love telling this story because I every time I tell it to my players, I coach AAU basketball on the side. I just tell it to them, let them know that, hey, no matter what you do, it's never that bad. OK, so for me. All the people talk about, oh, what's this girl doing playing basketball? I was in the 10th grade, JV basketball. First time I ever got put in the game. And I acted like I had never watched basketball before. Because you know what Michael Smith did? I ran out to the middle of the court to sub out a player. Didn't go to the <laughs> scorer's table. Ran out in the middle of the action. And was like, Kurt, Kurt, you got you coming out the game. Everybody like, dude, why are you on the court right now? <laughs> Nobody but most embarrassing moment of my sports life. So as much as I tell my Eli Manning story, that is the opposite extreme. I've never and, and nobody and my friends still haven't let me live that down. Speaking of which, this this <laughs> dude that tackled you or any of the other players on your fifth grade team 
have you had any kind of contact with them? Like, how you like me now type thing? Have they reached out and been like, oh, I'm either so sorry for how I treated you or you're welcome for me pushing you into sports <laughs> writing? Like, like, what kind of, have you had any kind of contact with them? You know, it's so funny. I ran into the coach after I like had started at Bleacher Report and I was profiling LaMelo Ball and he was so shocked. Like he was just, he could not believe it, you know? Mm. Um, and he literally didn't believe me. I was like, no, look it up. Like I really did go to Lithuania. Yeah. <laughs> and um, <laughs> the, the guy who said you really took a hit, I'm still friends with him and he listens to the Ringer podcast. And so for him, He's not shocked because obviously he saw that like I was a hustler and, you know, when I put my mind to something like I really go mm -hmm. after it. But for him to have seen that it is a different connection because he's just like, you know, you were just that annoying girl that like wouldn't leave us alone. <laughs> And now you're writing right. books. Nothing's changed. You're that annoying right. girl that just won't leave people alone. <laughs> I'm still here. Exactly. It's a superpower. It's a superpower. Exactly. But you exactly. but you did that wasn't the end of your basketball hoop dream. You did go on to play college ball, oh. I believe, for your first year. What's the scouting yeah. report on Marion Fader, the, the Hooper? Like you how what kind of ball player were you? Back when I had amazing metabolism, uh, didn't get injured by <laughs> sneezing or laughing. Um, yeah, I was really, really quick because I'm really small. So I'm five feet tall, five one in shoes. Um, and so I had to be quicker than everyone. I had to be smarter than everyone. I had to outwork everyone. Um, I wanted to be like, you know, Diana Tarazi. Ivory Latta at the time was like my inspiration, wanted to be like a score in a point guard's body. Um, so I could shoot, but I was always like, you know, obviously being smaller, pass the ball, <laughs> pass the ball. Um, but the thing that I actually really prided myself on was defense, uh, because you could always control that. Like, it didn't matter how tall you are. It's a, it's a pride thing. It's a hustle thing. And so, like, I really, really, really love to defend people and be annoying. I guess that is my <laughs> path. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, be quicker than everybody, be smarter than everybody, out hustle and out work everybody. So basically, you are as a writer what you were as a basketball player. You, you've, you've adopted that same mentality as a writer. But, but where did that come from? I, I've read and listened to you talk about your approach as a reporter, and it warms my heart. Where did that scrappiness, uh, that doggedness, um, that not taking no for an answer come from? You know, it's so interesting because I've I've thought about this for a while because once I quit basketball, I kind of was worried, like, you know, who am I without basketball? What am I? What am I? But all those same traits really did cross over to writing. And I sort of realized that it's not really basketball. It's not really writing. I guess it's just me. Um, part of me thinks it comes from, you know, my mom. She's very much like that as well, like very determined person. But I just think that I don't know. It's one of those things that's internal that you can't, I guess you can't really teach in the same way. Like when that guy tackled me, there was just something in me that just burned to prove him wrong. And I've always had that, like, you don't think I'm good enough. Like I'm going to prove you wrong. And I think it was the same in writing, you know, like when I first started, I was, you know, I, I guess, okay. So I graduated in college, uh, 2013 women's basketball was not you know, seen as what it is now. Like it was seen as like, don't cover that. That's not good for your career. And so I was mm. like, really, I felt like I was put in the women's basketball box. So to say like, oh, you're a woman, you can only cover women. And so that same like drive and passion and desire and hustle um, really came in. It was like, no, I'm going to show you that I can cover men too. So I think that actually really drove me early on in my career. And it surprised me. It was like, wait, <laughs> we're not playing basketball. But then it's like, Oh, wait, actually, I do approach this like it's basketball. <laughs> it, it's working. I'm going to read you something else. It might, it, it might sound familiar. Something magical happens when a girl touches a basketball for the first time. Power is in her palms. She can do anything, be anything. When she's on the court, she doesn't have to shrink. She can call a play as loud as she wants, and she can count on the court. The court never changes. It is the same when she arrives on a Monday a Friday. To love basketball as a young girl is to love something in a way that only other young girl hoopers can understand. It's different from family love, different from friend love, different from relationship love. It's a deep down love that resists explanation. 
Gianna Gigi Bryant had that deep down love. That was from your uh, 2020 uh, profile, uh, a series of vignettes from, I believe, over 30 interviews that you did for uh, BR Magazine at the time uh, on the late uh, Gianna Gigi Bryant. Um, and that lead just kind of connecting what we've been talking about. Like, were you almost, sorry if this sounds a little corny, were you almost born to write that lead? Because that, that felt like when I read that and reread that recently, that felt like, hey, this is that little fifth grade girl who loved basketball and would not be denied writing about, even though somebody was younger than you, who you never met, seemed like something of a hero of yours or a heroine of yours. Is that fair? Yes. Um, thank you for reading that and for seeing that connection. Um, it, that lead literally came straight from my heart, from my journals. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's so crazy because, you know, when it happened, it was so shocking. And my editor was like, you know, we want you to write something. And I actually was like, I cannot write about Gigi. I think because I knew subconsciously like this connection and this feeling it just was too much and it was really hard for me. Um, but I kept thinking about her and it's weird. I don't remember my dreams or anything like that, but I did keep like when I went to sleep, I thought about her. Like she just was yeah. like on my mind and then it became something that I felt like I must do something I was first, I was afraid to do. And then it was like, I have to do this. Like I have to write this story. Um, and then like really weird, eerie things started happening. Like one of her coaches actually coached me when I was in eighth grade. And wow. that was like so eerie for me. Um, because as you know, like from knowing my story, like that's just unbelievable. And then, um, it's weird because I had pitched the Gigi story when she was alive, but then we decided to not profile her because we felt like she's too young and we don't want to put that pressure on her. Um, but then all these things sort of just came together and I was like, you know what? I can't write this like a regular story. Like I, I have to do honor to this girl, this girl that me and my best friends saw ourselves in. Like, this is a different kind of this. It, I felt like this is this is the most important thing I will ever write. And I approached it like that. And I tried to come up with scenes and how to start the story. And then I realized, like, it's almost disrespectful to do a scene. This isn't a story. This isn't a this is a life. Um, and so the thing that just kept occurring in all my interviews was like the love that she had. I felt that when these girls were talking to me on the phone, I was like, that's what it's yeah. about. And I know what that feels like. That's, that's a very, how you, that's how you ended it. She was loved. exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. So yeah. I was like, wow. so I cried writing that getting emotional, but yeah, it was, it was really important to me. Do you still feel like it's the most important thing you've ever written? Cause you've certainly written a lot of significant uh, profiles and obviously a New York times bestseller bestseller. I beg your pardon. Do you still feel that way? I do. I do. I feel like it just, it just means so it's, I can't even speak. <laughs> I forgot how to speak English. Um, yeah, I do. I think that that is probably the most important thing I'll write. And it's not a good mindset to have that the best thing you did or the most important thing is behind you, but it's more out of respect to like what she meant to me and others like me. And, um, yeah, I, I just think like as you can, as you know, in my stories, like I'm not in them like I the Lamello stories were different because my editor literally forced me to be in the story, which was really yeah. weird for me. I'm not a writer that says, you know, I was in the place with this person and we were having lunch like that's just not me. Like I like to be invisible in the corner and let my subject take the show. But in this story, even though I wasn't quote in there, I was in there. And I think that that it, I needed to be to connect with the, the writing and to connect with her story to make it really meaningful. Is that what makes you emotional reflecting on Gigi in this process or is it is it something else? I think it's I think it's both. I think first just her and how sad that was. And then also just remembering like how you're calling up you know, 13 year olds and you're asking them about the death of their best friend and they're crying on the other line and you feel like this horrible yeah. person um, for doing this, but yet you're trying to honor your subject. So I don't know. I just remember like 
feeling morally conflicted when I was going through that. But then third, just, you know, I don't really get a chance to reflect on my story a lot. Um, you know, I'm so busy writing and what's the next story and what are we doing in this deadline? And, you know, that basketball girl in me, she feels so far from me now, but I guess, mm -hmm. you know, when I have moments like this, when I'm reflecting, I'm like, actually, she's every part of me. <laughs> And right. I, I guess I, I guess I don't realize that till we, you know, have a conversation like this. So I appreciate yeah. that. I um I I appreciate leads. I, I I love to nerd out about your process. Um, because back when I was a writer, uh, <laughs> once upon a time, and I often <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't invent. It. I forget who it was that said it, but I loved having written. I hated actually writing, and part of it yes. was because. You know, I would remember I remember sitting and staring at a blank screen because I could never write. Some people write in parts and they reorganize. I got to have my lead. If I don't have my yeah. lead, I got nothing. And so, you know, I, I love I love all your leads um, and even your most recent piece. Uh, the future of U.S. women's soccer is here for the ringer a couple of days ago. You know, Alex Morgan waited her turn. Before she morphed into one of the greatest footballers of all time, she was just a 22-year-old hopeful making her World Cup debut for the U.S. Women's National Team. And the thing I like about it is it's um, – and understand what I mean when I say this. It's simplicity and it's obviousness, if that makes sense. Because as you read the story, like, that came from Alex, mm -hmm. you know, waiting her turn. And I, and I wonder – what is your process for identify for first of all two part question which I'm gonna break a, a rule I'm asking you a two part question one <laughs> uh, what is your writing process to to the point I was just making about do you do you start at the beginning and go from there or, and let it flow or do you kind of reorganize but two how do you go about identifying bam there's my lead because that feel that eureka feeling I do miss that I do miss that feeling of being like that's it that's the start that's the lead that's the start of the story like what's that process like for you. So, okay. So I'm like so different from you in the sense that, um, I really, really, really struggle with leads so much that I have to leave it to the end because it makes me so nervous. Mm. Like the thought of somebody giving up on me because they don't like the first three lines is so much pressure. So I, mm. I can't, I can't start there. I don't know what it is. So what I do is, um, I, every story I do, I make a list and I say, what are my best images? And so like images could be a scene, um, but it could be, you know, like an image would be from that story. Um, I think, I think it was Rapino that gave advice to Trinity Rodman. That's like an image. That's a scene, those two talking to each other and sort of the validation that Trinity felt from that exchange. And I, I make this list. And if the list is short, that tells me like you haven't done enough reporting. You don't have enough, you know, bones to make this living, breathing thing. Um, but once I have the list, I then go to my second item and I say, what is this story really about? And really is in all capitals. Um, so, for example, it's not just a story about, oh, here's the young players that are to come for the U.S. team. It's like it's really about passing of the torch. It's really about aging. It's really about youthful excitement. It's really about um, sort of the not knowingness and being excited to jump right in. So once you know what that's about, you know that your lead and your ending have to correspond to whatever the answer to that is. So if this is really about passing the torch, then I have to pick something for that lead that so embodies that. And, you know, I, I sort of go through my, my notes and my quotes, and I saw that Alex had this um, quote about, you know, they're not waiting their turn. They're, yeah. they're, they're in there. Like I've never, I've never seen that before. They're, they're ready to go. And so I was like, that's what it, that that's it. It's that moment of, of connection. And so I was yeah. like waiting her turn waiting her turn. And then that's when I was like, that's the lead. Um, so I think it it's that, but you know, oftentimes I, I'll have a lead and then my editor's like, I don't really like this lead. <laughs> I need you to redo it. And so you turn in the draft, the final draft, but it's not really the final draft. You know, you keep working yeah. and you keep working. Um, I think leads are the hardest part. They're the most important yeah. part, but really the most underrated part of a story is the gut, the middle of the story. I think mm -hmm. when you have mm -hmm. 
you don't have anything there, that's when the reader gives up and that's when it's hollow. Like the people make fun of me for this, but like I used to work at um, a Froyo store in high school when I injured my foot. <laughs> I suddenly had nothing to do. And so I worked at this Froyo store and they would advise us to do like swirl the, the Froyo, but it would have like a hole in the center and it would be so awful as a customer. You're eating this ice cream and then you get to the middle and you notice there's like nothing in there because they didn't you got fill ripped it. off. Yeah. Got ripped off. And I think as a reader, I hate that feeling. I've invested so much in you. I'm with you. I love the lead. I love the first section. I love the second section. We're in the middle and it's like, you've burned all your goods. Like I'm out. Like there's nothing left. I got things to yeah. do. So yeah. I never, ever want to do that to a reader. So yes, I want to like emphasize the lead, but I also need to put equal emphasis on the gut, the middle of the story. I Did love that make this. any sense? Uh, Okay, because it made sense uh, in my head. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, it made sense. What I, like I'm, I'm taking notes. This makes so much sense. Like I'm, I'm, it's a master class for storytelling right here. List the best images and scenes, and what is this story really about? Have the lead and ending uh, connect and correspond with that 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 actual meaning for the story. That leads me to my other question. Like, do you do you set up, what are, what are your goals going into? Uh, an interview slash uh, reporting process. And also, again, I'm a, I'm a double barrel question again. I'm just breaking all my rules now. What is your goal for the reader? Because I, I love how you mm -hmm. talked about like, you don't, you don't want to feel, you don't want them to feel hollow, like they've been gypped out of their ice cream. What, what is your mm -hmm. goal for going into a process? And what is your goal for a reader once they consume that finished product? Yeah. So when I go into an interview, I tell myself, this is literally just another human being on the other side of the table. And I'm just here to learn more about them. And I think when I say that to myself, number one, it takes the pressure off of me that I feel because I get nervous before every interview. Like, I think it was like Wilt Chamberlain. That Still? Before. Yeah. Like, yeah, like, I it's, like it's Monet Davis all over again. I was going to ask you, you took, that was a question. I was gonna, <laughs> did you still feel like you did the night before you interview Monet Davis? Oh my God. Okay. I appreciate you so much for like taking the time to look up these things. Yes, I really do because yeah. the stakes are high. Like I will never. You also take have a high story. bar. You got a high bar. <laughs> I, I <laughs> mean, I am not, I, I, I want to reach higher. I want to be better. And so, and I also know that like, all this could be gone in a second. So I definitely approach it literally like I'm, you know, doing that Monet Davis story. That was my tryout. That was my like, you know, can you, can you make it moment? Um, but I, I, so I do get really nervous. And so I try to um, just tell myself like this person that is on the other end of the table, they've gone through things just like you. They've doubted mm -hmm. themselves like you. They have families just like you. And they're probably nervous too. And so I think when I take that approach, that really colors the whole conversation because I know something interesting is going to come from it because people are interesting. And even if you're talking to somebody who you are prejudging and you think they're not interesting, I promise you like there's something interesting. And so the challenge and the joy is me finding out that. Um, and so to your next question, like when the reader finishes the story, I want them to say that was interesting. Like at, at its peak, what storytelling can do, it can make you feel emotion. Like we talked about Gigi and you can think it's compelling, but at the very least, I want you to leave feeling like that was interesting, you know, mm -hmm. because stories done right, you don't say to yourself, man, I just wasted 20 minutes of my time reading this story. Like when yeah. it's good, you're like, I'm, I'm glad I did that. Let me send it to somebody that I care about. And so I want you to feel that way. Um, and I also want you to, I want the experience to continue after it's done. So for example, like when I see LaMelo Ball in his cell phone commercials on the TV, I immediately start cracking up because I just know so much about him from spending all that time with him. And I think of all those anecdotes when I see him being a grown man, making millions of dollars from these commercials. And I want the reader to feel the same way. I want you to, you know, watch the World Cup game and you see Naomi Gurma and you see that scene in my story where, you know, a young girl is coming up to her. So I think it's just like 
when you see your favorite athletes on TV, I want you to know yeah. about where they come from, what drives them, what scares them, what excites them. And so if I can if I can give you that information that you think of when you watch them in the actual games, like I've done my job. Mission accomplished. I'm taking notes uh, <laughs> like I, like I'm back in school. I'd have been a much better writer if I'd have met you uh, young, when I was younger. But you do speak to a lot of universities, obviously. Um, yeah. uh, you know, speak on, on sports feature writing, uh, journalism and storytelling. You've spoken at uh, Berkeley, Penn, Northwestern, Mizzou, uh, Virginia, Middlebury College, uh, and even now at, at the school of my main man, Michael Smith, you are, are dropping knowledge on the, uh, the art of, of feature writing. Uh, but what do you tell young people, uh, not just specifically about uh, feature writing and reporting, but just about this business in general, whether it's, I mean, you know, access or the lack thereof, layoffs, uh, AI. I mean, like the landscape is just shifting at such a rapid pace. It, it, it's scary. Uh, I imagine I got, I, I have a tough time talking to young people. I get asked advice all the time. Like what kind of advice? I don't know how to advise young people because when I broke in, you know, Boston.com was four people in the middle of the newsroom that we ignored. It's like this, this right. business has changed so much since I was a young person. What do you tell young people when you speak to them besides some of this, uh, this this golden uh, you know information you just gave about about how you approach your craft, but just about the business in general. It's so hard um, because I am realistic, but at the same time, I I'm trying to offer you know a balanced approach that doesn't ignore the harsh realities. You know, fully embraces them, but also you know tries to maintain proper perspective. So, for example, I graduated in 2013. Um, Every time you say that, I feel old, by the way. Every time you say that, just just for the record. (laughs) It's happening to me, too, because now I'm at the the convention and and all these college graduates are coming up to me. and I'm like, fuck, I am old. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So it's happening. Don't worry. I'm getting it back on my end. Um, I, you know, the athletic was not around in 2013. Um, the ringer, I don't think was around. I think Grantland was still a thing. So, Mm -hmm. you know, when I would reach out to veterans, they would have this horrible pessimistic view and, and say the same things like things are terrible because they, they were at the time as well, but that's like 500 jobs that this crop has now that I didn't have. Like Mm -hmm. it was absurd to think of a college graduate join becoming the beat writer for major NBA team or college team. So I try to like a a little kernel of positivity is like, that is true. That's glass half full. I like that. Yeah. Like that is literally true. Um, You know, there are just opportunities now that there weren't before. Um, but then I'm also real about the um, the difficulties. You know, when I was at the OC register, like I was making, I was there for my first four years and I was making $30,000 and I worked like 70 to 80 hour weeks. I was a basketball coach for a high school in my free time. So I was like driving mm-hmm. these vans, these girls, like, you know, just what am I doing with my life? And then I was freelancing as well. And then I was driving to Orange County from LA doing my job. So, you know, that was not a glamorous life. Like I was watching all my classmates, like I felt like they were succeeding and I wasn't. Like I felt like people were going to ESPN and I wasn't. I was covering like some random soccer team in the middle of nowhere, Orange County. So, but I tell them, if you really love this, and you mm-hmm. really, really want to do this, then go for it with all your heart. And if it's not feasible financially and it doesn't happen the way you want it to, you can get out and do something else. I would say like 90% of the people I started with are not in our industry anymore. And that's wonderful for them. Like they are very happy with their lives now. So it's not like you graduate college and you have to know everything. Give it your best shot. Like, and and if it really truly is untenable, then you'll pivot and figure something out. Um, you know, the other thing I tell them is like, think about books. Like, I always wanted to be a book writer. I saw the industry crumbling when I graduated. Like, I knew things were bad, but I saw the lifestyle of people that wrote books. And I was like, 
okay, that's it. I'm going to do that. I'm going to somehow do that. And it, it took 10 years to get, you know, a literary agent that believed in me and, and all of that. But I was thinking ahead. So I tell them, like, if, if you want to be a features writer, if you want to be a book writer, then put all your energy there. Um, and the other thing is like, uh, and somebody said this to me, nobody goes through this industry unscathed. Like I got laid off yeah. after my four years at the OC register. I was like 25 years old feeling hopeless. You know, people go through that at age 50. People go through that at age 25. It's going to happen. So yeah. it's it's like take away the roses. But then I remind them finally that like this job is so awesome. And I feel so like, I know this sounds so corny, but I feel so alive when I'm writing. And so if you really love it, like, yes, of course you should go after it wholeheartedly. You want to be an actor? That's awful too. Awful. You know, there's, the odds are stacked against you. You want to be an NBA player? That's hard too. So, you know, know the realities and go after it if you can. So that's what I try to do. And I tell people two things to echo what you're just saying. One, if you can write, you can do anything. And the other thing, and your and your story is an example, is you gotta love you gotta love the process. Like to me, I always I always took issue with the phrase "trust the process" because trust implicit in the word trust is a level of reluctance, um, as opposed to embracing something. Like I I prefer love the process. And if you love the process, the results will come or not. Maybe they come, maybe they don't. But you're not in it for the results. You're not in it to get on television. You're not in it to get awards, even though you got plenty of awards. You're not in it, you know, for 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 money. And obviously, that's a that's a thing. You know, you got to make a living, but you're in it because you love it, and that comes through in your writing. That hustle, though, you know, and and let's get to it's a perfect segue uh, into your New York Times bestselling book, Giannis: The Improbable Rise of an NBA MVP. Um, which you wrote in real time and published just as he won uh, the NBA <laughs> championship a couple of years ago. Like, um, but my favorite, perhaps my favorite nugget that I, I got from you hearing you talk about that process was that despite how much of that book was devoted to Milwaukee and its relationship with the Bucks, the organization didn't help you at all. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I would love it if you could take us through a, because it started through, uh, you know, you were doing a story about his brother, mm -hmm. one of his brothers. Uh, it led to this this book on Giannis, but just your process of having to, like, break down barriers and, and, and walls, because there's so many obstacles in the way of access nowadays. Yeah. Back in my day, it was different. I mean, look, there's, Miriam, as you know, there are so many athletes who have just cut out the middle man or woman, in, in this case, as in us, that own their own content, that have their own content companies or content plays, that have their own podcasts, or, or teams that, that do the content themselves, where they don't need uh, a, a third party to tell their stories. And yet here you are, constantly finding a way to uh, inform us and enlighten us about people that we don't know much about, starting with obviously Giannis's biography. So kind of take us through that process of landing that, that opportunity, but then uh, seeing it to fruition despite any obstacles that were in the way. Yeah. So I, like I said, I really wanted to do a book for a really long time. Um, and basically like you have to get a literary agent and then you have to write a proposal. And so I maybe wrote like two or three, like serious, legit proposals on other topics. And I would send it to different like literary agents and proposals and, you know, all, all that. And the feedback was like, I like you, but you're too young. I think you're on the rise. Not quite there yet. I love you, but don't think your idea will sell. <laughs> so it was like wow. not quite. It was like it was like something with me or something with the idea. And the hard part about books is that the publisher, it's it's all about money in the sense of like it's not just having a great story idea. Like it has to actually have mainstream appeal to be able to sell. Um, and so for me, that's just a different mindset, right? Like when I pick my stories for long form, I'm thinking, what is the great human story? What is interesting? Like, I'm not thinking about what is going to sell or whatever. So it took a really long time to try to figure it out. I got really frustrated. And I said, if a book is for me, it will, it will happen organically. I can't, I'm not, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to pause on like trying to come up with the topic. And 
when I did this story on um, Giannis's youngest brother, at that point, like the family, the, the way it is now with like, you know, they have their companies, they're very uh, front facing the family. It was all, it was more of like a Milwaukee niche thing. Like you knew he had um, younger brothers. You knew that he loved his brothers, but it wasn't like this national um, thing. And, and the brothers were not front facing, honestly. And so it was more like I was like, oh, he has a fourth brother? Like, I didn't even know that. He was like 15. Um, and so I just started with the question of like, I wonder how difficult that is being the fourth. Like that, that's a lot of pressure, you know? Like, and Giannis hadn't even won his first MVP. He was like a budding superstar, but it wasn't like Giannis the way it is now. And um, yeah. so I just, I, I go to his house and then Giannis happens to be there which I was like so shocked because I don't know. I just, I assumed like, there's no way I'm going to get him. Like I, I'm just going to focus on the younger brother. Like I'm sure Giannis is like out doing superstar things, you know, Giannis <laughs> just, things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, I was like, there's no way he's going to be there. And then, and then I ended up turning into like a full day of like, you know, spending the day with them and the mom was there and Costas, the other brother was there and, you know, I'm going through my notes afterwards and I'm, you know, doing the process that we just talked about, like, what is this story really about? And I realized yeah. I was like, this is not a profile of Alex. This is a profile of a family. Um, and so that's why when you read the story, it tells you as much about Giannis as it does Alex. And so the wheels just started turning because so much was cut from that story. And I was like, you know, I really feel like there's so much here that I didn't get to say this this feels like a book. Like this feels interesting to me um, yeah. because so much about Greece, you know, at that point, the only thing known was like, he sold trinkets on the street. Um, yeah. What does that mean? Like literally, what does that mean? And how do you get from trinkets on the street to, you know, near MVP? So I was like, there's, a, yeah, there's, there's more a huge, to that story. <laughs> there's, yeah. yeah, there's a huge information gap. Right. And like yeah. knowing what I know about like, you know, Europe and, and, I just knew like it could not have been easy for, you know, a black immigrant um, family. And so I was like, why is that story not told? So I had gotten introduced to a literary agent earlier that year, like maybe like six months before. And I gave him ideas and he 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 said, my door's always open for you, but I I just don't think these are the ones. So, again, it's like that hustle. And then I came back and I was like, I just wrote this. I just feel like there's this is a human story that will connect with people. It's a family story. Like, what do you think? And so he agreed that, you know, this had legs. Um, I realize I'm talking a lot, but um, fast forwarding. No, to your, yeah. Fa fast forwarding to your point about. Um, there's a lot of ice cream in here. There's a lot of ice cream in here. Don't worry. There's, 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 it's not hollow at all. You're good. <laughs> so much. Um, and so fast forwarding. Um, so like the Disney movie that they had was like already in, you know, the, um, the, the rise, the Disney plus movie that mm -hmm. I feel like that was the works for like five years plus, like even before I did that story. So, you know, to your point, like athletes are just kind of like, well, we have our own things. So, you know, we don't necessarily like need to do stuff that, you know, aren't, you know, our brand or our business. Um, mm -hmm. and so it was like, absolutely fine. Um, and I got to interview the family again. So that again, like when you're, when you're hustling and you're reporting, you try to interview as many people as possible. So I interviewed the brothers yeah. again, you know, interviewed all the people close and around. Um, the unfortunate thing was that the timing of it was such that obviously we didn't know that it would be the championship. We, we obviously didn't know they'd win the championship, but the book was supposed to come out when it was supposed to come out because that was free agency. And at the time when I proposed the book, um, he was going like the biggest question was, is he going to stay or is he going to leave? And so that, that was supposed to be the timing. Now, as a result, the bucks who, you know, may were, were facing losing potentially the cornerstone of their franchise, like, obviously like they're not going to want to help or do any media for this person mm. that you know, is in this very tenuous situation. Um, so unfortunately, like that was hard. And also people didn't want to be seen as tampering in any way. Like, okay, if I let uh -huh. you interview this person, or does that mean you're asking about the free agency? Which I was like, I swear to God, I'm just asking about skinny Giannis circa 2014. <laughs> um, but, right. but, you know, so you dealt with that. But at the same time, there were so many sources available to me 
Um, and I did end up talking with many, many people within the books, you know, just without the PR's help. But I found that the richest story was back in Greece. And so for me, it's kind of like the same approach. Like I said, like I loved playing defense, right? Because that's effort. I can call 50 people. I can call 50 more. Um, I'm not going to get bored. Hmm. I'm going to get tired, but I'm going to keep going. So that's a if, word. Yeah. Um, so call if 50 so, people. I can call 50 yeah. more. I ain't getting bored. I like that. I like you that. Know, I'm like, that down if, too. If, <laughs> yeah. It's like if somebody is going to say no to me, like, okay, that's reality. I respect that, but I still have a job to do. It's still due. So I'm still calling people. So I guess it was the perfect time to write a book. It was during COVID. Um, I was locked in my apartment and I was just calling people from Greece at like 6 a.m. <laughs> LA time. <laughs> that's 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 awesome. That's that's good stuff. Um fast forward to this off season, okay? Um I wonder how everybody had an opinion when uh the Bucks were bounced in the first round by the heat. Everybody, including yours truly had an opinion about Giannis's viral, there are no, there, there is no such thing as failure, only steps to success comments. A lot of people celebrated it. A lot of people were like, come on, man, like, let's not get to a point where we're eliminating failure as a concept, for, you know, from sports or from life, because it's, anyway, I, I could go on and on about that. I would love to know how you process that moment, that commentary, given how well you know Giannis uh, and given his rise from selling trinkets on the street <laughs> and, and much more, right. uh, but just, but just how you process, not just what he had to say from his very legitimate perspective, um, but also just how it was received uh, nationally. I mean, um, it's funny because as soon as I saw it, I had this exact, I had a, a reaction and then I looked to Twitter and I saw that, Bomani Jones had my exact reaction. So definitely going to credit him here. But I was with him when he said that, you know, it should, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember exactly what mm -hmm. he said, but my sentiment was like, of course, somebody who comes from where right. he comes from is not going to look at it the way that everyone else does, right? Like there's yes. an anecdote in my book that I immediately thought of, which was, him counting his Oreos rookie year, noticing that a staffer took them from his apartment because just because you signed a million dollars doesn't mean you shed the scarcity mindset that you lived your whole life with. You're going to count your Oreos. Right. You're going to know how much you have at all times. So, of course, he's not going to look at failure like everyone else because it's like he is the definition of success. But I think both sides are right right? Like yes. the, the basketball world, they're right. And he's right. There's not one right, you know, yeah. can be seen as a failure from an, a basketball standpoint, because of course that was, uh, I mean, but, but not also there was uh, extraneous factors, injuries, all these things. Sure. So, so I, I think everyone can be right. Um, but to me, yeah, to me, I, I speak with a lot of like, like not just universities, but young people, like young readers yeah. And, yeah. and they, to see what that speech meant to them was so important. So I just think that it can serve a purpose for everyone. That can be a valid thing to say that can affect, you know, and inspire children. And yes, obviously the books clearly like did not do what they were supposed to do. And those people are right as well. Both can be true. Well, and I think both are true because in some ways, it, I think both sides are saying the same thing. Yeah. Because And I will get on my soapbox just for a second. My issue with it was not, uh, yes, that's a great life lesson. And Giannis, certainly, you under, not only do you understand why he would see things that way, but deserves to see things that way, if that makes sense, if I'm using that right. I think the problem is that failure is a bad word to mm -hmm, some people, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it shouldn't be. There's a, it shouldn't be a negative connotation to failure. I know inherently it's negative, but I think, and this is what Giannis is doing, if we flip it on its head, like failure is necessary, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I don't want to live in a world, or I don't want to live a life without failure, quite honestly. You know, because I mean, obviously, Tom. I think Tom Brady is one of the people who says we don't lose, we learn. 
So I think we're kind of all saying similar versions of the same thing, just packaged differently. Um, but moving on from Giannis, or not from Giannis, but now looking into his future, he has a new coach. Mike Boonholz is gone. Adrian Griffin, you know, no head coaching experience. I love to know, again, given what you know about Giannis, how you think he's poised to lead this organization uh, through uncharted waters, so to speak. I mean, At least he for him. was. You're right. Yeah. No, I mean, he was somebody that Giannis wanted. So, the, you know, he's got to have it. So work ethic is like a word that really gets thrown around. But I think Giannis work ethic, as we all know now, is very different from normal work ethic. So whatever Giannis work ethic is, is the same one that his coach has to mirror. So I absolutely know mm-hmm. that, you know, from top down, you're going to have that same hunger and desire and nothing is given to you and um, work for everything. And, um you know, don't think you've arrived. So I, I actually, I mean, if he, if this is somebody that he has, you know, really advocated for and wanted to, then he, he has that absolutely. Um, and not being satisfied. And maybe to your point, like looking at failure and all of these things a little bit differently. Um, I, I tend to be one of the people who say that he will be successful no matter where he goes or who he plays for. Right. But I do think that, you know, they must, have a bond that goes beyond yeah. basketball. If all else fails, he can go to Saudi Arabia and make seven hundred million dollars for one year. That was a great. He, he's dying. so funny. He's so he's funny, so and he does funny. look like Mbappe. I know. I was like, oh my god, I cannot, I cannot. But that's why when he people say, like well, that's why when people say like, oh, like, can he be the face of the league? I'm like, what do you want in your face of the league? He, he's yeah. so marketable. He's so funny. He's so kind. He's so intense, so driven, so hungry. You know, it, it's just got the full spectrum of the modern yeah. super. You know, because how many superstars do we know are amazing at basketball, personality flat, like, or personality yeah. so, so uh, big and vivacious, and then the game doesn't match. I mean, he's like the rare person yeah. that has. But if I could assign you a, a, an NBA story right now, I would send you to to uh, to to do a story on Nikola Jokic. I want to I want to read a, a Mir and Fader story on Nikola Jokic. I, I I I want you to unlock the 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 what's bubbling beneath the surface on you because you know something's there. There's more to that story too. I- I have been trying to do that story for literally like three years, and this goes back to mm-hmm. your point about access. It's like. That story really just has not been told. And it's like, it's very weird when you see somebody all the time, they're all in your face, they're on TV, they're winning championship, all these things. You think you know everything about them, right? The horses, all this, but I guarantee you it's just scratching the surface. Like, I want that story so bad, Um, Mm. so bad. Um, So I'm not going to give up on it. That's for sure. (laughs) Please don't, please don't. Um, (laughs) I got some other assignments for you, but I get to, I get to you in a second. I want to get to those later on before we before we let you go. But I just want you to know how happy I am that your next book you got a tough act to follow. But your next book, <laughs> your next New York Times bestseller, is uh-huh. on my all time start. Like if I, if we still do in positions, let's say we still do in positions. My all time starting five center has always been Hakeem the Dream Olajuwon. It's always been that's my that's my guy. Back back to failed basketball stories. So oh I've been this height since I was like 14 years old, right? <laughs> and so back in back in my day, centers play with their back to the basket. And I had right. a mean, Mirror, I'm not lying to you. I had a mean baseline fadeaway Whoa. dream shake. Okay. okay. I had I had the dream shake. I had it down. <laughs> so when I saw you were doing a book on Elijah Wan, I'm like, count me in. I, I'm here for this. How did that come about? How are you inspired? How did that opportunity come about? I'm so excited for that book. I, you know, I just I can't wait to see what you unlock with the dream. Oh my God! Thank you so much. Like your energy, I just I feel your excitement and your energy. It's making- <laughs> I should have worn my Hakeem T-shirt. I got a red Hakeem oh, Elijah. Watch. I should have worn that T-shirt. <laughs> Where is it? Yes. Um, <laughs> no, I I feel the exact same way. I felt like, okay, here's the obvious. He is the most underrated superstar in modern basketball history. Like, no question. I'm shocked. Yeah, I'm just, I'm shocked. There's just been like nothing on him. Um, And 
I, it's funny because so like the Giannis book, we talk about the theme of like, what is this really about? I felt like the Giannis book, yes, it was a standard biography, right? Like it's his life, but it taught, I mean, the hope was it taught so much about Greek history, politics, American politics, basketball, culture, all of these things. And, and Giannis was almost like the metaphor for today's modern era of the international superstar ushering in this new era. But I always thought about Hakeem um, because he was the first. He was the pioneer. He was the true international superstar when the league wasn't what it was. And I really felt this deep in my heart, which is that everything you see now, the Giannis of the world, the Embiid's, it goes back to Hakeem. And he's never been given that credit. And part of that is because he never wanted that credit because of his religious beliefs. He doesn't seek credit. You know, he's the embodiment of humility. But the world that Hakeem came up in, where there wasn't any international players, where he was an immigrant, that's how we better understand the Giannis's of today. And it's been such a fascinating journey to, you know, research and deep dive and do this book because similar to how I felt about, okay, nothing's really known about Trinkets on the Street, um, Giannis. There's like nothing known about Hakeem's childhood in, in Lagos. And, you know, the Civil War happened when he was like four years old or something like that. And there's just so Dude much was to was kicking him. ass while he was fasting. I mean, yes. for so, Ramadan, well, like, like this, it's just, this is so, so good. Then, it's so good. So then, yeah, so then the religion alone, right? You bring in the, all <laughs> right. of that and then the religion and just how misunderstood he was, um, you know, and how really people don't realize that like 9-11 happened right as he got to Toronto. I mean, this story has so many different tentacles. And of course, we cannot forget. Fire like Slam said, Jamma. Fire Slam Jamma, yeah. the dominant basketball. Hakeem, I can't tell you how many adjectives I've run out of, of how to say pirouetting, whirling, twirling, spinning, moving, shaking. Um, it is an, is an exercise in the thesaurus for dancing on the basketball court. Um, yeah. But I, I just, I want to write about interesting people, not just dominant athletes. He is both. Yeah. He, I mean, I'm so excited. I, listen, I'm hype. I'm hype. I mean, you know, <laughs> Hakeem, Hakeem. I mean, you're going right. to take us through the whole evolution. The whole I mean, H-day. I. I I'm telling you, I, I, I mean, listen, the, the, one of the best compliments I can could, I could think of for Hakeem Olajuwon is like, nobody looks at the 84 draft and been like, ah, you know, Rock has got that wrong. Like, nope. <laughs> nope, not, not at all. No, they, they nailed Jordan it. The Rockets did their thing. Say Jordan what you want himself. about the Blazers. <laughs> yeah. Right? And Jordan himself, like, the most complimentary towards towards Hakeem. And I, I like you said, the dra- I mean, the draft alone is fascinating. Like, I just think yeah. these are moments in history. And, like, you know, if somebody's under 30, like, it makes me sad that they don't know him. And I think that part of writing is, is you're trying to um, – you're 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 not just trying to write about who is quote hot right now. It's it's about history, yeah. it's about legacy. Yeah. Um, and so I just think this book is really important. So I'm super there, excited. There is there is no there is no for example Joel Embiid without Hakeem Olajuwon. Um, sure. But somebody speaking of the draft, somebody else I want to talk to you about that I'm fascinated by, and the more I talk to you, the more I see why you guys connected so much beyond your lo- your shared love of reading and that's Scoot Henderson. Um, yeah. You know, I mean cuz cuz right now we're 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 consumed by by Dame time and Lillard watch, Lillard watch when mm-hmm. the Blazers if his track record is any indication may have gotten as big a star, maybe not literally as big, but as big a star as the Spurs got it in Victor Wembanyama and Scoot Henderson at number 2. Um I guess first I'll start with just identify. Was was it the fact that he's the youngest professional uh, American basketball player ever when he signed with, with with the Ignite? What was it that led you to Scoot Henderson? And beyond the purple cow, why'd you guys vibe so much? What what what, what, what stood out to you the most about him? Yes, and purple's my favorite color. We will get to that. Um, but yes, <laughs> I. <laughs> you know, like you said, he was the youngest pro. So at that time. You know, I think people forget that about Scoot. I beg, because... I beg, and I beg your pardon. Scoot was a number number three pick. I, I'm sorry. Forget about poor Brandon Knight. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, 
Look yeah, at yeah. Amazon. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think people forget that at the time that he made this decision to um, go to the G League, he was the youngest pro. And that was seen as like, whoa, what is he doing? And I think because NIL legislation hadn't passed yet, all these, you know, over time, all these other things that were popping up hadn't really gotten the traction. People forget that a lot of Scoot's story was about being this like new school, you know, doing things differently. Um, and that was really attractive to me when I saw that. The other thing is like, obviously I had been trying to get the Wemby story like everyone else. And hmm. there's a whole line of people for that. And um, you, you are definitely some... a zigger when they zag. I could tell that about <laughs> <Yeah>. you. <laughs> so I was like, okay, everyone's doing that piece. I'm going over here. It's kind of like, so like in college, I was, um, I was interning for the Clippers and I was, I got to write for their website. And of course, everyone wanted to be around Chris Paul and Blake Griffin, but like nobody was where Roni Turioff was. <laughs> and <laughs> I was like, you know what? Let me go over to Roni because he's going to actually talk to me. And so it just, it taught me such a valuable lesson of like, I learned so much from Roni in that interview and I didn't need to do what everybody else was doing to write a valuable story. And so it's kind of the same principle here. It's like nobody was really talking about Scoot as much. And I just found him so interesting. And so like what I like to do when I go to a city and I report a story is like I'll just informally talk to everyone around him without even like starting the recorder. And I was like, so what's he like? Like what does he do outside of basketball? Like what's he like? And they're like, you know, his nose is always in a book. And I was like, really? Like what books? Um, you know, cause they don't know that I'm obsessed with books. Like they don't, that, like that's, yeah. you know. And um, I, the PR person was like, you know, he mentioned this book about a purple cow. So like immediately, like You're I like went to get, the book. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> are you kidding me? We have a story. Um, and I read it. I was like, of course he loves this book. It's all about being different. It's all about being a purple cow in a field of, you know, cows that are all brown or whatever. And, um, and so that was the first question I asked. And he was so shocked. He was so shocked that I was asking about a book and not like, how does he feel about the draft or whatever? And, you know, I could just see his like nervousness sort of melting away because it was like, we're just talking about books. And, um, yeah. Yeah, I just, I really enjoyed that interview. He's such a thoughtful, interesting person. And I think the books are kind of a metaphor for what I think is what makes him so unique is, is the maturity. It's really, really yeah. hard to be, you get a private jet at like age 16, 17. And um, he just sort of acts like he doesn't drink his own Kool-Aid. He knows how good he is, but he's not, yeah. I'm screwed. I'm the greatest ever. Um, well, what was like, one I'm of the lines? Um you know, he plays like he's trying not to get cut from JV. Oh, you know, yeah. He doesn't play yeah, like, yeah. He, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, no, he's, yeah. I, he's, he's, it seems like he's been a pro. I came away mm -hmm. more convinced that he's going to be a star at the third pick. Nothing bothers me more, and I make him more often now that I'm getting older and my brain is starting to go than making mistakes. I also think I said Brandon Knight, maybe because I just talked to DeAndre Jordan recently. I met Brandon Miller, <laughs> obviously, for if you keep him track at home, know how many times Michael fucks up. Uh, I was talking <laughs> I met Brand Brandon Miller out of Alabama, second pick to the Hornets. Yes. Miran Fader's next feature. You'll probably unlock something about him that we don't know. He is an interesting dude, by the way. Brand Brandon Miller is actually not not a not a bad uh, subject for you. Scoot Henderson, though, so he gets drafted by the Blazers, Damian Lillard's Blazers, a Damian Lillard that he reached out to for advice, yeah. slid in his DMs once upon a time. I mean, I. Without getting too far down into like you know where he's going to end up in the heat of it all and you know player and yada, I I would love to see those two play together. May not make a whole bunch I, of sense from a team building standpoint, but it just feels like man, that's kind of unfulfilling if you if you reach out to this guy for advice. Such a great story with with an unhappy ending, you know. I mean, you sh you should have seen um, Scoot's face when he showed me the DM. He was it was so cute. It was like. Oh my God, look who responded. Like, and it, and the, and then I read the message and it, he didn't just say like, Hey, I, you know, I'd like some advice. Like he, it was very like how we want journalism students to reach out to us. It was like, and he said his full name. Hi, my name is Scoot Henderson. As if like, <laughs> you know, nobody knows who he is. Hi, my name is Scoot Henderson. Like I was wondering if I could get some advice on blah, blah, blah. And he named a specific thing. And so, and he was so like, 
touched that Damien wrote him a substantial answer. It wasn't just like, mm. you know, keep that up. It was like a real paragraph answer. And so the profound respect that I know Scoot has for Dame is there. And I'm sure that Dame, you know, has that same respect. I think it would be so cool for him to learn from Dame. See, for me, I think, I think rookie year, it's all about learning. It's all about you know, mentorship. And like, what if he had that mentorship? Can you imagine how beneficial that would be for Scoot? Like that would be just a masterclass. And and listen, this is a conversation for another podcast. I still think there's a chance that they they do end up together. Um, it's not just basketball with you, though. Um, you've obviously covered all sports, but I, I think back to a recent article uh, about Devontae Adams. And, you know, I want to kind of do a little six degrees of separation with Devontae Adams. First and foremost, his situation with the Raiders and now Jimmy Garoppolo and not Derek Carr uh, and the the validation he actually – it was so refreshing to actually hear an athlete talk about external validation for once. Say, You know what? It meant something for me to make first team all pro without Aaron Rodgers. Like, he didn't make me. Um, But now – He's got to find a make it, find a chance to make it work with Jimmy Garoppolo, potentially with no Josh Jacobs. And I, I think Devontae recently came out uh, and said, "Like, yo, we, we need that guy. We got to find a way to make this work." Like, where do you see Devontae Adams at this point? And is he just lost in a in something of an untenable situation? Like, turning around the Raiders, which which he says to you that he wants to do, seems yeah. like a tall task to say the least at this point. This is essentially the tug of war that is, I feel, his life right now and the central tension of the piece, which is unwavering commitment on his part and optimism in the face of extraordinary obstacles, also being realistic. This is clearly rebuilding. Like, this is clearly rebuilding. But he's not at that age. You talk about age. He he doesn't, as as he said, I don't have time. Um, I want to. came here to do this. But... I, I just I, I can't I can't make myself younger. I can't you know like I'm I'm ready to win. I want to win. I came here for a reason. I didn't. He said I didn't come here to just be cute with Derek. Like I really believed in this organization. I believe in this organization. So I just think it's tough because like as a receiver, there's only so much you can control, right? Like that's what's how- so crazy. He yeah. kept saying to you, I control what I want to control. Receivers are the most dependent position on the field, arguably. Like they and, you can't throw you can't throw himself the ball. <laughs> you know? And that's so hard, right? Like, and that's why yeah. I thought, see, I thought what he said was extraordinarily mature in that piece, which mm-hmm. was I recognize that I don't have control over a situation that isn't perfect, far from perfect. At the same yeah. time, I burn to achieve what I want to achieve in the limited window that I have. So what can I do? It's And that's why it was called the race against time, because he is going to continue to race and try and give everything to try to make this work. But you're up against sort of the one thing you don't have control over also, which is time. None of yeah. us have. It's Nobody literally does. you're trying yeah. to catch a ghost. Like it does. It doesn't. It's impossible. So I, I just think. You will see from him what you always see, which is extraordinary effort, heart, uh, intelligence, passion, um, leadership. But what else can you do with your team? I mean, I I, I just think yeah. it's going to be a rough year, which is unfortunate. Yeah. I wrote down uh, Chase Yourself from that story. That was one of the nuggets I got. I just I love that uh, that mantra, that mindset. Um, going back to assignments. Uh, that I'm, I'm assigning you to. <laughs> um, yeah, where's my I'd, I'd pen? Like, I, like, let's get this pen out. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to. I'd like a Aaron Fader feature on Aaron Rodgers. Believe it or not, I think a lot of people wow. at this point are kind of sick of him. You know. Yeah. But yeah. Just I. I wonder. I don't know. I maybe maybe there's a different side of him that you can uncover for us. Would he be? I think it's it's an interesting thought. Like, and I thought of that so much when I was doing this piece. I was like. I kind of wish, you know, I could get that, like everyone else, get that story. But um, is he at the place where he would be frank in the way that, Mm -hmm. see, the thing with with profiles, and and it doesn't have to be this way, right? Like we talked about, you know, the Giannis thing. You don't exactly need 
full access. But the thing that really makes a profile sing is when the subject and the writer are clearly in connection. And mm. connection doesn't mean I'm on your side. It just means there's clearly an intimacy there, a professional yeah. intimacy, where you feel heard and understood and you feel seen. And the writer yeah. is not here to show you that she's the star. She's here to write your story. And I think that I don't know if he would do that. Aaron would do that, right? But I think if he was, that would be so incredible. We are in sync. I say all the time, you want to do an interview or you want to have a conversation? And they're two different things. You can have a conversation. There's a place for that. But you can't right. have an interview and, and make it a conversation because you're defeating the purpose of an interview. Uh, by the way, one of my favorite nuggets from Devontae Adams was the fact that uh, he met his wife. I love How Did You Meet Your Significant Other Stories, uh, helping her with her math homework in college. I thought that was awesome. Um, more assignments. We mentioned Mbappe. I, lo I, go to, if, if, I, would, I would love to see you uh, do a profile of Mbappe. Uh, the person who I think is the most dominant, hands down the most dominant athlete in North American professional team sports, Shohei Otani. Would love, would love to know, learn more about Shohei. Have you, been, have you been chasing that one? Yes. And like, it's so frustrating to be in Southern California and to like continually get shut down for this. Yes, I'm on it. I'm on it. You're I'm, I'm motivated. Um, After this, I'm going to literally email everyone, like, just following up. Like, if I ever had a memoir, it would literally be called Just Following Up by Mirren Faith. <laughs> Here I am again. I like it. <laughs> just following up. You want that? Would you like that to be the title of this podcast? I was thinking uh, there's more to the story. It could be Just Following Up if you want. You're, you're, it's, your, it's your show. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> who who else who else is out there that you're curious about? Because I know you, you know, and that's what I think you could do with Rogers is 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 even though we think we know everything about him, there's another layer that you could probably uncover. I know you like to write about people uh, that we don't know a whole lot about, especially as humans. Is there somebody else that's on your on your on your wish list right now that you could share? Um, been pursuing. Let's put it in the atmosphere. Yes, let's manifest. Um, yeah, I'm. I've been wanting to do this and I've been pursuing it for a very long time. Um, a Naomi Osaka profile. She's somebody okay. that I just feel like there's so many layers that have not even scratched the surface. Um, and it's really, it's, I, I think the discourse around her, it makes me sad. It makes me like, I feel for her. Um, and I wish that she felt seen and understood and heard in the way that we just talked about when talking with media. Um, so mm -hmm. like I don't get anything for that profile. Um, secondly, Brittany Griner, like mm -hmm. when I saw that mm -hmm. she was doing a book, I was like, oh, I wish I could do that book. But um, I don't know who's doing that book. But I really, really would love to do that. And not just not just what happened, but again, it's it's the emotion, it's the feeling, it's how are you changed, right? It's not just what you went through. It's what are you, what did that do to you now, right? We know that it doesn't just end when it ends. It's like you're back in society, you're living here. But I imagine that there's effects of what happened. And I think that would be really yeah. painful to talk about. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think of who else. You know, I have like... There's two lists always in my head at all times. There's the super famous Britney Griners of the world. And the big then there's gets, yep. yeah, the, the big gets. And then there's the like, who are the quote faceless, nameless that you don't know about that their stories really, really, really matter. And those things matter to me so much more than the big gets. Mm. Uh, so I'm pursuing those other ones kind of just as yeah. hard as the and let's and let's and we're gonna keep that off the record too, because you don't want to get nobody no ideas either. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know. You don't nobody steal, nobody steal my that, that, yeah. That no. private that's a private list. That's a I, I, <laughs> I, I it was understood need not be spoken, but I spoke it anyway. <laughs> that's a private list. That's a private list. Um do you do you really read a book a week? Before writing this book, I did. I, I read I usually read around like 70 books per year. Um, wow. but I literally had this like convo with myself the other day. I was like, man, I am just so slacking this year because, 
you know, with the Hakeem book, I'm reading, but it's such it's a more... slacker. You're such a you, you. Oh my gosh, what are you doing? What are you I, doing? My Fader? perfectionism <laughs> is like going crazy with this. Like I, and you know what? Like when I read my book a week, I feel so creative. And I've just noticed that, like, when I'm reading less, like, I I feel really stagnant. I feel really slack. Interesting. So this is yeah. this is good motivation to like get back on it. Has anything touched you uh, the way Beloved did? That is such a high bar. Um, I actually really read this book that really touched me um, last month. Um, it's called Why I think it's called Why Fathers Cry at Night. Um, mm. All right, sounds the, like something I should read. Oh my god, it was so good. Why is the author's name escaping me right now? Um, it just came out. You'll easily find it. I feel so bad for yep. like. That's okay. If you can find go, the go author, ahead, keep talking though. It was so good because it wasn't just like um, a memoir. Like this person usually writes children's books, but it was about. Um, oh, it's Kwame. It was, it's Kwame Alexander. Oh, yeah, why fathers in. cry at night? Yeah. A, a memoir in love poems, recipes, letters, and remembrances. Yeah, okay. it just came out in May. Yeah, Kwame yes. Alexander. Okay. Okay, so this yeah. book really, really, it. really, yeah, this book really, really moved me because first of all, it was so unique. Like I love that there's a poem next to prose, next to a recipe, but it it really um, you don't really see books of men going that deep as far as the vulnerability and interiority. And he managed to talk about, yes, masculinity and fatherhood, but it was really about grief and loss. And I guess yeah. I knew from afar as like somebody I admired. And like I said, I knew of his books, but I had no idea that he lost um, so many people and also like went through a divorce and all these things. And I just thought that he has done the work and he was ready to write. Sometimes you read a memoir yeah. and you say to yourself, okay, this person has just wrote this because they're going through it and they published their journal. He, yeah. he has done the work to where he didn't need to tell us everything, but he told yeah. us just enough to move us and help us and impact yeah, us. He's awesome. Uh, yeah. So I just, it was so good. It was so good. So I really liked that book. I like how you said you feel more creative when you read, which is kind of counterintuitive in a sense because you're reading what somebody else created. And I wonder how you balance consumption with production, mm -hmm. as in like, you know, you read so much, you obviously consume so much content, you're aware enough to be able to, you know, formulate ideas about what subjects you want to pursue. And you're obviously busy being a prolific writer yourself. Like, how do you balance, like it being kind of cluttered in your head with being inspired like you were by Kwame Alexander's book. Yeah. It's interesting to think about, right? Like, I guess it's true. I do get really cluttered up there, but I, uh, <laughs> I think it's more just like, just say it. I'm a genius. I can handle it. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Um, I think it's because writing has always been, I mean, reading has always been like the refuge before mm -hmm. I became a writer. So I just look at it like how people look at Netflix. Like this is my unwind. So I don't yeah. really look at it like, like, yes, I am quote studying when I'm reading. I'm like, oh, that phrase was yeah. good. Let me un underline yeah. it. Yeah. But I'm not like, like most of what I read is actually fiction. So I am like, if, if it's done where I have full focus, you know, and I'm not just like multitasking or whatever, I actually don't even think about my writing career when I'm reading. It's like I'm yeah. lost in the story, you know, and so I just I really like that. And also, like, well, I can get I can get jealous. Right. I can get really jealous. Like, oh, my God, that person's so good. But it right. isn't like a, it isn't like a oh, my God, that person's so good. And. I will never be them. It's like I'm fan girling, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I just love. I'm just an appreciation appreciator. Oh, I need to read more clearly. It's not a word. Um, <laughs> I just appreciate it, so I look at it more as like a fan and not a rival. Yes. 
So no, I, I appreciate that. And you, and you got me where I was trying to go. I, I don't think I phrased the question properly because I do believe if you want to be a better writer, read, you know, like yeah. you can't, you can't be one without the other. And I, and I know how much as great as you are, you're constantly evolving. And, and you're, as you said, a work in progress before I, I, I meant more from a competitive sense. So thank you for taking oh, it that way, because oh. as we talked about, you're a, you're a zigger while everybody else is zagging. You're, you know, you're talking to the backup offensive lineman where everybody's crowded around the quarterback. And so like, for example, your, I, I was fascinated. So your, your most recent piece on a ring, ringer, the future of us women's soccer is here. Now, obviously, yeah. as we both know, and as most common sense people know, you don't write the headlines, but SI's daily cover last month was the future is now for the U S women's national team. In other words, that's not an unusual angle about this team. That's a storyline that many people have covered. And yet you, you know, you, you put that, that mirror and sauce on it. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you did your thing with it. So it's like, I, I guess what I'm saying about the consumption, because what happens to me at least a lot of times is even as a talking head, I don't like listening to other people's opinions because okay. then, then, it, then it starts to cloud mine, which is a very different exercise from reading. But even as a writer, sometimes when somebody writes something, you know, it's hard not to get into the comparison game, at least for us mere mortals. So that's what I meant more about like when you are, you know, consuming so much content, you know, uh, and, and then trying to then, then tell people something that they don't know about somebody, how the challenge of not letting that seep into your subconscious. Am I making sense now? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, All right. I think, Thank you. I think <laughs> <laughs> if the internet is a crowded space. It's unrealistic to think that you're going to be the only person to write about anything. Like that's unrealistic. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just not going to happen. Um, and I've had situations where I've literally had stories come out on the same day as another writer of the same exact subject. Um, mm -hmm. But to me, to me, I think it's less about like, I don't really struggle with the like seeping into like what you were saying about the subconscious and how do I know what's my, because to me, when I see two different stories, I think it's really cool because it's like, look how different they are. Like, look, like mm -hmm. you, could, it's the same, like you give a recipe to two people and it tastes slightly different. Like, yeah, that's creativity. That's, that's what I find cool. Part of the reason why I, maybe I don't worry about the same thing that you just mentioned is because I would say, and maybe this makes me a really bad sports writer, but I would say that like 95% of what I read or listen to is not sports. So it like doesn't, no, like I said, reading Kwame fair. Alexander, no, like I don't, I find a lot of, I know this sounds really mean or bad, but like I find a lot of the discourse like inhumane and yeah. I don't like listening to it. So no, that's real. What I thought you were going to say, which would have been a mic drop moment, is be like, well, honestly, 95% of what I read just ain't as good as me anyway. So it doesn't, no, <laughs> so no, it doesn't. No. <laughs> No, I know you oh. wouldn't have said that. I know you wouldn't have said that. Listen, oh. I've I, I, I monopolized so much of your time, but there's a couple of things <laughs> I did want to ask you, just going back to, like, just making us all better from listening to you. Um, how do you listen? Oh, love that question, because listening is the bedrock of reporting. And I think sometimes we all think in this kind of like main character era that it's all about what you say and what you ask. But I think the best people are the best listeners. Um, and the, I think I listen for emotion. It's not really what they're saying. It's not like a comment about this coach or this thing. It's It's more about like, are they struggling to say this? Is there something I'm viewing? watching them talk. Can I, can I feel the emotion? Can I hear the emotion? That's listening. Listening is not just like words, like what they're saying. It's like how they're saying it. You can tell when somebody is like, like when you asked me about Gigi, I was like immediately like, Oh my God, you know? And I think like, yeah. that's listening. Um, and so I think like, there are moments where like 20 minutes will pass by in an interview. I haven't said anything. And 
I, I want to caution against, you know, overstating that because some people tend to think that, oh, the athlete just comes to you and unburdens themselves and you don't have to do anything. That's not true <laughs> at all either. Yeah. It takes a lot for to like gain that intimacy and that trust. And I think part of it is because of the listening. Like when I start the interview, I'm going to ask about your favorite book. I'm going to ask about your mom or whatever. So from the get-go, you see that I'm like here to listen to you. I'm not here to get like a sound bite. So I think some of my yeah. best interviews came from just like being quiet or being silent, you know? And how do you observe? I mean, this is my favorite part. Like I don't like to be in the center. Like I get really nervous when I have to like go on TV because I'm like, ah, I just want to hide in the back. Um, and so like I... I observe, I always have to have an, a notepad um, and I'm writing down every single thing that I see. I sort of look at observation, like imagine having a camera on your stomach and it's just taking pictures of everything, shutter, 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 of everything around you. And if you get lost in your head of like, is this detail important? Is that detail important? Is this, then you're missing out on being present. So I just write down everything and then I tell myself like, I'll make sense of it later. I could talk to you all day, um, just but I should out. probably oh let you go and get, I probably should let you go get to work at this point. Yeah. Uh, Fader, thank you so much for, um, for the work you do for the ringer. Mm -hmm. Uh, but thank you for the, thank you for your time. Thank you for, uh, your passion, uh, when it comes to the, the art of storytelling, uh, and your insight. And this has been fun. I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I love to do it with you again, and uh, I promise you, I won't. I won't take up ninety minutes of your day. <laughs> but this was fun. I literally have a lot more, but I'm gonna go ahead. As, hey, you know, as a writer, you got to know when to end it, right? You got to know when to like cut it off. You got to self edit, you right? You do, but like I didn't yeah. even realize we had been talking for that long because it was so fun. And I just want to thank you for just your thoughtful questions and, you know, for for being such a, a fellow, you know, appreciator. We're going to make that a word of writing yeah. and reading. Yeah. And uh, when Hakeem comes out, we will do a Hakeem debrief together. Yes, I would love that. I would love that. Hey, that, say less, as the kids say. I would love that. Uh, I look forward to it. I appreciate you. Keep up the great work. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for kicking in with your main man, Michael Smith. Be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel, but also subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Rate it, review it, tell your friends about it. Oh, and be sure to follow me on social media.